Perhaps the most long-lasting impact, for instance, of American wars in Syria, Iraq, and the rest of the Middle East is the refugee problem. After so many years of constant warfare, the people of the Middle East suddenly started leaving. They couldn't take it anymore. And so now Europe is trying to, is obviously the first one to deal with this, this problem because they're the closest place that people can go, but also throughout Africa, you're seeing huge uh, numbers of boat people leaving war-torn countries. That's what they're leaving. They're leaving countries where they can no longer maintain themselves in any kind of way. So these massive refugee problems now are a direct result of imperial wars uh, over the last 10, 15 years in these areas. Previously in the United States, there were all the Central American wars, all the interventions of the United States in Latin America that forced all of these Salvadorans and Guatemalans and Hondurans to come to the country, to this country in the 80s. So you've got to understand that, one, the United States is not alone in this problem. But number two, the United States has a particular history as a country that often has identified itself as an immigrant nation, that immigration has always been a big political battleground in the United States, always. And uh, because there's always a, an attempt by those who came a while ago to portray those who came more recently as part of the problem, whether it was the Irish in the 1840s with the Know Nothing Movement, the Chinese in the 1880s with the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, whether it was the Polish and the Russian Jews and Italians in the late 1800s and early 20th century. But now what really has made the, the situation more difficult now is that there's not only a cultural and ethnic component to the migration, there's a a racial component to the migration. And so now you're increasingly dealing with the reality that the bulk of the migration to the United States over the last 50, 60 years, half of it has been from Latin America and uh, two thirds to three quarters. <laughs> the rest of it has been from Asia and Africa. Remember back in 2006, <laughs> there was an attempt to pass a comprehensive immigration reform. Good evening. I've asked for a few minutes of your time to discuss a matter of national importance, the reform of America's immigration system. The issue of immigration stirs intense emotions. Why has it taken so long? Well, because this, the final immigration legislation that is passed will essentially define who is legitimately in the United States in the 21st century. It is really going to define the composition of American society. Everybody who's involved in the negotiations knows that. There are big stakes here in terms of who gets to be elected to office in 10 or 15 years, you know, how the resources of the country are, are divided up. And it's really a question is who is legitimately in the country. The fascist trend represented by Trump wants to totally reverse immigration policy to instead of saying, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, you're going to be free, give me your best educated people who have the most money, who can buy, essentially buy their way into the United States, either as a graduate student working in Sil uh, for Silicon Valley. Or, or an investor in one of Kushner's companies. <laughs> or Yes, or an investor in one of Kushner's company. You are essentially now, the trend is to buy your way into the United States, to get people who were educated in India or China uh, or some other, or Mexico, where those governments invested in their education, but then the United States stole the brains, right? Essentially bought the brains. Uh, and those countries invested in their education, but they didn't get the benefits of their education. Trump calls it chain migration. The official term is family reunification. They want family reunification out because that would only allow the already existing working class migrants who have already become legalized to bring more of their relatives. They want to end that. They want to bring in a whole different type of migration into the United States. And I suspect also increasingly make it a wider migration. The dreamers are like the, the sexy part of the migration reform. What is going to happen to the technological workers? What is going to happen to the, uh, the agricultural uh, workforce, uh, which is still needed? They still need agricultural laborers to pick the crops that pe you know, people in the United States are going to eat. Under what conditions will these other categories of migrants be able to come into the country? You, of course, as NAFTA was coming to fruition, were reporting extensively on uh, the potential 
outcome of this. At the end of the day, your political analysis, and correct me if I'm wrong, ends in the same place as Trump's when it comes to wanting to get rid of these kinds of uh, of so-called free trade agreements, but for very different reasons. I'd like to hear your critique of how NAFTA and other so-called free trade agreements impact workers in the United States, but also in other parts of the hemisphere. Remember, NAFTA was passed under Bill Clinton. In a few moments, I will sign the North American Free Trade Act into law. NAFTA will tear down trade barriers between our three nations. It will create the world's largest trade zone and create 200,000 jobs in this country by 1995 alone. NAFTA and all of these free trade agreements were based on being able to exploit the huge gaps in income that already existed in the world. They were going to take advantage of that, not to necessarily raise the income levels, but just to take advantage. It's like a currency trader who tries to trade between the differences of values of currencies between countries. That's all it was. And so unless there is somehow in the policy a commitment to close the income gaps between countries, and not just the income gaps, the gaps over environmental controls, the, the gaps over protection of workers' safety uh, in these places, it will always, there will always be a race to the bottom, to which country offers the cheapest labor and the worst environmental regulations and the worst labor safety. You know, no, now it's no longer Mexico or even China. Now it's Vietnam and, and Bangladesh. And there'll always be another country where the elite will offer you a better deal in the race to the bottom. Would you celebrate the dismantling of NAFTA, even if it was based on Trump's rationale or motives for it? Well, it's definitely good that the that these agreements are being revisited. The question then becomes, though, uh, who negotiates the new ones? You know, because eventually any trade agreement has to go through Congress. And with the, the makeup of Congress now, you could conceivably have a worse <laughs> trade agreement for the, especially for the people in these other countries than you have now. It's positive that at least what Bernie Sanders raised about uh, these trade deals during the campaign and what Trump raised about these trade deals at least broke the control over the debate that the globalists in American capitalism, along with the media, had that anybody who raised the criticism of these debates was crazy or a f- uh, fringe. Uh, so that's changed. That's changed. People understand now that these trade deals have been uh, have hurt the American workers and have hurt the people in the countries where they were developed. I was recently looking back at your excellent book, uh, Harvest of Empire, that also has been revised. And it made me start to think how so many people in this country, when they talk about immigrants or when they talk about undocumented immigrants or people who are here with protective status or people who were brought here uh, by their parents and they didn't have documentation, we never talk about why people have come here from uh, any number of these countries. Give an overview of the harvest of empire and why people started migrating from south to north at different points in history. Well, I think the basic thesis of of my book, Harvest of Empires, you really cannot understand the massive growth of the Latino population in the United States uh, in the second half of the 20th century and the early 21st century, unless you understand the role of the United States in Latin America in the late 19th and early 20th century. That, in fact, the 50-some million Latinos now living in the United States are a direct result of the United States' creation of an imperial empire in Latin America. And in fact, the United States is not alone. The reason there are so many Algerians, Tunisians, and Moroccans in France is because those were the colonies of the French Empire. The reason there are so many Indians, Pakistanis, and Jamaicans in England is because those were the colonies of the British Empire. Uh, The reason there are so many Turks in Germany it's because Germany got laid into the imperial power game and after World War I basically absorbed the Ottoman Empire and began going into Turkey and other places in the Middle East. But what basically what happens is that World War II was a seminal moment in the colonial world because all of the powers in World War II 
all impressed their colonial s- soldiers into the war. The French drafted the Algerians and the Tunisians into the French army. Uh, the Americans drafted Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. My father and his two brothers all served in a Puerto Rican regiment uh, in World War II that was attached to Patton's 7th Army. They were all recruited right out of Puerto Rico, not even speaking a word of English, to fight in World War II. Even African Americans who came up from the South, a lot of them were impressed into World War II. So the result was, after the war was over, the soldiers who returned all became the leaders of their independence movements of their civil rights movements. If you look at all of the people in the civil rights movement in the United States, many of them were World War II veterans. Uh, in the same thing in the Mexican-American community, in the Puerto Rican community. They came back having been trained and fought in World War II and said, hey, we just defeated fascism, but we don't have rights in our own country. After World War II, you get the huge surge of African independence and Pakistan and India. They're all, all the colonial powers are forced to give up their colonies. But then, because these countries had already established roots of trade and commerce and information with the metropolis, suddenly people started leaving their countries and going to the metropolis. Algerians started going to France and Tunisians and Indians and Pakistanis started going to England. And people who came to the United States were largely from countries that were already directly intervened, like Puerto Rico or Cuba, Dominican Republic and Mexico. And then, of course, Nicaragua, Salvador and Honduras. So basically, you can directly trace the mass migrations of every imperial power in the world to their former colonies. So that's why I say that the Latino presence in the United States is the harvest of the American empire. For the first 150 years, the colonial powers tried to get the resources, the gold or the the copper or whatever resource they could get out of the colonies. But then what they never expected was that the people themselves would come, that the workers would start using those same routes of trade to migrate to the metropolis. Had the West not try to dominate the entire world (laughs) and colonize the entire world. It would not be facing the kinds of migration situations that they're facing now. And the people just at a certain point said, hey, we may as well go to these countries if we're considered to be subjects of these countries. And so uh, during the 20th century, the third world stood up and became independent, but still is economically controlled by the West. And now gradually, at the late stages of the 20th century and early 21st century, the workers of the third world started coming to the West. And now capitalism is faced with the problem, how can you argue for no barriers to capital? For whether it's a money transfer, whether it's an investment opportunity, whether it is uh, lowering tariffs on trade, how can you argue that we're in a global world and capital must be free to move anywhere it wants at any time and labor can't? How can you argue for freedom for capital but not freedom for labor? And when the reality is that more people are on the move today than ever before in the history of the world. I mean, if you look at uh, the numbers of Filipinos and and other people that are basically propping up the economies of the Middle East, (laughs) you know, and the numbers of Koreans that are working in Japan. There's been mass migrations, not just the United States, but all over the world, labor is in motion. And you cannot continue to lower the barriers for capital while erecting walls (laughs) against labor. It doesn't make any sense. So I think that's the quandary that global capitalism has today. How do you Make it easier for business to make money while you're, you try to make it harder for workers to make money. It seems, given everything that you've just described, that there are two main drivers of undocumented immigration to the United States from the South, either wars and conflict that the United States has played a, a direct role in, or people have shattered economies that have been targeted by neoliberal economic positions of the United States, by the corruption of uh, dictators who have been backed by the United States, or that their countries have been pressured into very bad deals for their people, and they're coming seeking economic opportunity. And I mean, every single person that I know that is undocumented in this country is 
an incredibly hard worker who is living in a crappy situation and sending a lot of money to support a lot of other people in their oh, home sure. country. I and, mean, that, that is well, almost the that, exclusive story that I, I know. Migration is itself a self-selecting process because the people who leave are usually the most industrious, the most willing to take risks. So basically, the very process of migration is it selects out the most industrious, hardworking, and risk-taking people. So to portray them as the people who are going to commit crimes and destroy the society is completely at odds with the facts. One of the things I raise in Reclaiming Gotham, which is that it's been documented that sanctuary cities in the United States have lower crime rates than non-sanctuary cities. It's firmly established that the crime rate among immigrants is far lower than the crime rate among U.S.-born citizens. (laughs) There's a lower crime rate. And yet you want to find the examples that you can find, because you'll always find examples of people committing crime in in any group in the society, and elevate those to the norm rather than to realize that they are the exception.